So how do you get out of intestacy, the default rules? You can write a will. Uh, I'll uh, call the last will and testament, or commonly referred to as a will. It's a document that, that, that covers the disposition of all these probate assets. So again, if you have a 401k or a life insurance policy that says, on my death, pay to my spouse or my kids, that's going to go wherever you've designated, whether you write a will or not. And if you write a will, the 401k is still going to go to wherever you've designated it goes to, no matter what the will says. The will will only cover the things that fall into your estate that don't have a joint title and don't have a designated beneficiary. right? But in the will, you can put directions for guardianship of minor children. It's the biggest reason the parents write a will. You can designate the executor who's going to um, administer the estate, who's going to go through that court process. And I'll explain how you pick an executor in a minute. And you can include provisions such as a testamentary trust to have rules of how money is managed or spent for the beneficiaries. So how do you provide for your children in your will? Um, it, we talked about designated guardians. Um, and a will for parents with minor children needs to think about how we're going to manage the money for the kids. Uh, are we going to have some special rules on the kid having to reach a certain age or meet a certain criteria, like finishing college before they have access to the money? Or are we going to make some transfer under one of these uh, kind of default rules, the Uniform Gifts to Minors Act or Uniform Transfers of Minors Act, where there's a custodian holding the money for the benefit of the kid? Or can we put money into a college savings account? And I'll talk a little bit later about 529 accounts and how those work and what the, the benefit is of those. So if you're going to write a will, you need to pick an executor. The executor's job is to go through that probate process. Um, they're responsible for making reports to the court and handling the finances, paying taxes, basically being the administrator of the estate. And so typically, if you have a spouse, you're going to pick your spouse as the first choice. And if your spouse doesn't survive you, you might have other family uh, or friends, or you could have an attorney or, or someone else you trust act in that role. And uh, in Virginia, the executor may be required to post a bond, or you can waive this requirement in your will. So the bond requirement basically is insurance. It says that uh, if my executor runs off with the money and doesn't give it to my beneficiaries, the bond is insurance to pay back uh, the beneficiaries so that they don't run out of money. So if you pick your spouse as your executor, you don't really want to have them have to go post a bond because now they're going to take money out of your estate to pay for the insurance to make sure that they don't run off with the money that they're going to get anyway or that your kids are going to get or whoever you designated. So in some cases, you might want to waive that bond requirement and reduce the cost of administering your estate. If you don't write a will, you can't make this choice, right? It's something you have to have a will in order to decide. Sometimes you'll put trust provisions in the will, and I'm going to talk a lot about trusts later, uh, but a trust will allow you to have some control over the assets after you've passed away. If you have small children, most everybody will want to do this on some level. Uh, it allows you to designate who's in charge of the money for the kids and specific rules. How are we going to spend the money for the kids? Education, health care, living expenses until they reach a certain age or finish college, and then the kids get control over their own money. So if you have trust provisions in your will, you need to pick a trustee. And the trustee could be the same person as the executor, uh, or it could be the same person as the guardian, uh, or it could be somebody completely different. Uh, you can have a bank's trust company, you can have a, an attorney, or you can have a family member, or really anybody can be a trustee, right? Um, so you get a lot of flexibility on who you pick, and every family is different, so you kind of need to make that decision based upon your family and what makes sense. So the other things you can add to your will, you can make other bequests, which are specific gifts, $10,000 to my brother, or you can make gifts to a charity, you can make uh, gifts to the Red Cross or your church or whatever you'd like. You can make gifts of tangible personal property. Uh, and Virginia law allows you to have a separate writing for tangible personal property. Uh, so we'll talk about in a minute what the procedure is for signing a will. Uh, and there's an exception for uh, specifically tangible personal property. So tangible personal property is things that uh, are physical, that, that uh, do not have a title. Uh, so jewelry, artwork, all the stuff in your house, right? Uh, real estate is not personal property, it's real property, so that doesn't count. Uh, and intangible things like bank accounts uh, wouldn't be allowed under this rule. But basically, the tangible personal property rule allows you to make a separate writing that doesn't have to have a witness or a notary like the will does, that designates grandma's diamond ring goes to my sister, and the Renoir painting in the living room goes to my cousin, or whatever those cases might be, right? So you can carve that out, and that's something then you can update without having to go back and see a notary or have witnesses like we have for the will. 
We talked a little bit about charitable gifts. There's a lot of flexibility in this if you want to do it. You can have a specific dollar amount, you can have a percentage, or you can have some threshold. You know, if you have little kids, it's often, I really want my kids to be taken care of, but hey, if I had $10 million, then yeah, we'll give a little bit to charity. So you can set those priorities and figure out how you like it. The nice thing about charitable gifts is they can reduce any tax obligation if you have a state tax obligation. So when you're ready to sign your will, how do you do this? And this is very important. If you go do this yourself and you don't use an attorney uh, to have you help uh, draft your will, the procedure is very important. And uh, we actually make a lot of money helping people who didn't get their will signed correctly because it's a big, pa uh, big hassle. Um, so if you want to sign your will correctly, you need two witnesses and a notary. Uh, the witnesses and the person signing the will all need to be in the same room, and the two witnesses both need to see the person signing the will all together. Right? You can't have one person see you sign it and then another person come by and see you sign it. Uh, and then you want to have what's called a self-proving affidavit. The notary is going to notarize a little sworn statement saying, I saw the two witnesses see the testator sign the will. Right? And then that gets notarized. And by doing that, you don't have to then go find the witnesses later. We had a case just recently. Um, somebody had done their own will and they'd, they'd gotten it signed properly. They had two witnesses, but they didn't have this notarized statement. So uh, they had done it at the UPS store out in Fairfax, and we had to go out to the UPS store and find these two old employees from years before and get them to testify that they had actually seen this person sign the will. Kind of a pain. And you can imagine if it had been 30 years gone by, it would be a real pain. Uh, so the procedure is very important. And the original will has specific legal significance, right? So a lot of documents, a photocopy is okay. We'll talk about that with powers of attorney or trusts. A photocopy of a notarized thing might be okay. But you can have one original last will and testament. And when you go to the court to, to take it for probate, you have to have the original. If you don't have the original, we have to go through a whole trial to try and prove that the copy we have was a copy of the original and that the person who died didn't revoke the old one. It's a big hassle and very expensive. So once you've signed the will properly, you can take it to the courthouse. This is another wonderful Virginia benefit. So uh, different rules in different states. But Virginia has a statute and for $2, you can take your will to the courthouse and they will keep it for you in their safe. It's a huge benefit because they'll keep it for you. Even if you move to the other side of the country, you can leave it at the courthouse here as long as you were a resident in Arlington at the time that you wrote the will. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about where the original is. It's, it's private as long as you're alive. And it only becomes public if you die and somebody shows up with your death certificate saying, I'm the executor and they need to admit it for probate. Right?